Hey, this is David Walensky, back with another interview from the audio archives of NoDon'tDie.com. This time I'm bringing to you the first half of my Q&A with Owen Deary, who's a game developer based out of Ottawa, Canada. He and I spoke on July 2nd, 2017. And uh, just a quick reminder, uh, if you want to read transcripts of other interviews I've been doing these last few years, you can go on over to NoDon'tDie.com. Um, you'll also see a link to my Patreon, where your support helps me continue the work that I've been doing. And now, here's Owen Deary. Sure. So, my name is Owen Deary. I'm 28 years old. I live in Ottawa, Canada, and I've been making games uh, sort of independently for the past six years. Um, I spent a lot of time uh, starting out making web games, just small little things. And then uh, about three years ago, I started working on a game called Small Radio's Big Televisions. And the past three years has been me working on that and eventually publishing it on PlayStation with Adult Swim Games. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to get really existential on you out of the okay. <laughs> For Nothing better to do on a Sunday. Uh, so why make uh, video games at all? I mean, like... Growing up, was this something that you always wanted to do? Was it something that you worked your way up to doing? Um, you know, sort before of, you gave yourself uh, permission to do, or sort of, yeah, how did you get to that point? Yeah, I don't know. It's sort of. I I remember growing up, and me and all my friends. It was it was almost like being a rock star. It's like, oh, it'd be super cool to make video games for a living, but none of us had an idea how or if that was even like a thing you could do. Um, and. I was always sort of into computers and super into getting into the stuff behind the games, like the cheat codes and messing around with config files. And basically that just built up over the years, me understanding more and more about how these games were made and, you know, messing around with the Unreal uh, tournament tools and all that sort of stuff. And then eventually I graduated high school and had to figure out what I was going to do next. And the local college had a game development program. And so I said, yeah, sure, why not? And I basically just went from there. I, I, I had never programmed before, but as soon as they said, okay, here's how you start, I just sort of took to it immediately and haven't really been able to stop ever since. And I mean, like, so I did not go to school for journalism, but I always hear that the the the, the sort of cliched, well, now cliched uh, thing that professors tell, you know, journalism students is, oh, don't go into the industry. It's terrible. Only do this if this is the thing that you really feel called to do and I think they say that about every vocation now, but, um, you know, the whole games, academia, um, which can mean any number of things, but I guess, I don't know if where you went, it was more of a vocational approach or if it was more of an academic approach. It I was, mean, it was definitely a more vocational approach because it's, it's, it's a college and it was a three-year program, so they do a lot of sort of hands-on skill-based learning rather than going to university and getting a more academic background. They bring you in and say, okay, here's the skills you'll need. If you want to do this job for a living, we'll show you, and then you can go out and do it, which I think was really helpful because I'm not a, I'm not a very academic or studious person, yeah. so I don't think I would have been able to thrive in university at all, so it was really good to go somewhere where they're like, here's what you do and how you do it, and now go do that thing. I mean, were they, were they similarly, like in Jay's school, um, discouraging, or, or uh, what was sort of the attitude among... Uh... No, yeah, I mean, they were generally pretty encouraging. Um, honestly, if if I had advice to give them, I would say in the first year, let everyone who comes in the program know that there's not a lot of money in games. Like, if 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 you're doing this, make sure that you really want to make games. Yeah. Because you can you can do way easier computer and programming work and get paid way better, but if you want to do games, you're going to have to take a significant cut in whatever. Um, yeah. I mean, your, were your, uh, I mean, were your, were your parents, uh, like how did they react when you figured out this is where you, what you wanted to do and what you wanted to go to school for? They were super wary at the beginning, I think, cause in high school I would just spend all day inside on the computer and they hated that. They thought I was just like wasting my life. And so, when I was, <laughs> Well, because it's like, you know, I, I, at that point, I wasn't, like, making games. I wasn't creating anything. I was basically just, like, playing first-person shooters all day because I was a teenager. Research. And Yeah. And, uh, and so when I was like, okay, I'm going to go to school for this, they were like, okay. And I think they weren't really sure how it was going to turn out. But I think after the first semester, I, they were able to see all the work I was putting in and the fact that I was actually getting something out of this program. Mm -hmm. And then I think, I think they warmed to it at that point. I mean, did you did you consider uh, working at a game 
company or studio or, or yeah I know you so, just finished a contract but I don't know what your whole resume is yeah so right out of uh, the school program I started work at a studio like I graduated on Friday and then I started at the studio on Monday um, it was this really old in Ottawa called Artec and they had been around for 30 years they had started doing uh, like Atari 2600 games in the early 80s so they'd been around for a long time, especially in terms of uh, studio age, because most studios don't last that long. So I started this gig, and I was like, sweet, this is like the most stable game development company that has ever existed. I can just like work here for as long as I want. And uh, six months later, they shut down entirely, forever. Of course. And just closed. Of course. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I was, I was just like, okay, well, it's, I still want to keep making games. So, and I had a bunch of money saved up. So I just sort of started making these web games to see if I could make ends meet while working on the stuff I wanted to, and I basically just never stopped. So, I mean, you mentioned, I think even up top, um, but you also mentioned in our emails, I mean, you said, uh, you know, if you worked at a game company, I think you said, or better yet, if you worked at a regular software company, um, I think you just sort of were talking about what ways and why it would be better to work at a quote unquote regular software company. So I mean why why is that quote unquote better to you um than a game company? I mean, is it because uh the contracts are longer? Do they do you, do they feel like they're more stable? Or, yeah, well or there's, what are the reasons? There's definitely stability there because games, you know, it's an entertainment business. It's 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 always sort of the wheels are about to fall off. Uh, so with a software company, usually it's far more business oriented, uh, more focused. Uh, there's a lot more stability. Um, and also, like like I said about games, you have to take a significant pay cut if you're going to work in games. But if you're working in software, you can have a very, very comfortable living doing some relatively simple work. You know, you asked before about things I've learned, and that's definitely something I have uh, learned or at least remember is that a lot of people talk about, you know, when they when they tap out of games, when they go into software, um, you know, if that is the path they go down to, they don't necessarily always have to go into software. But when they do, um, I think there's like two or three things they've all told me. One of them is... <laughs> uh, they're happier. They, they, they make more money... Um, uh, I think there's a better work-life balance, but I also remember some people telling me that there's almost like a, a little bit of discrimination from the software world against the game world where uh, I think that there's this attitude where they feel like in the game world people learn sort of bad uh, programming habits or I think it's because, you know, the projects, I don't know, I hear so many different things because... Either the projects seem to be really similar to one another in games, or they seem to be really different, or maybe it's just hard to predict. Um, but they feel like, you know, because they are switching around on so many projects, that just their their core skill sets aren't as strong as someone who is just focused on a single thing and doing that at a software company. I mean, have you heard have you heard things like that where sort of software looks down on games a little bit? Not firsthand, but like it's definitely something that I felt internally. Like, like I, I, I can't think of anywhere where I've actually experienced that, like anyone doing anything or acting in a way that looks down on games experience. But mm -hmm. as someone who, uh, you know, doesn't have a huge academic background in computer science or programming and has only really worked on games and hasn't worked at huge tech companies, going into this contract I just finished up at a regular tech company, uh, I really had to sort of gain some self-confidence in you know, working with this team and being like, no, I can, I can do this work just because I come from games doesn't mean that I'm incapable of this because there's like, even as someone who makes games, I still feel like there's a stigma around games, but I'm not sure if that's just my own feelings or not. So it's hard to say. Uh, I mean, there definitely still is, I think it's a different sort of stigma, like the main stigmas that were around a couple decades ago. Yeah. They still linger in some parts of the world, but they seem to have dissipated. Yeah, for sure. And sort of taken root elsewhere. So, I mean, what what's the sort of stigma y y you feel like uh, you run into in a professional sense? Thinking, thinking about it now, it, it might be just based on my experience with my parents when I was in high school, because they hated me yeah. playing video games so much that I think maybe I just have this like shame about them. Were you were you an only child? No, no, I have I have three other siblings. None of them played games. 
they did, but not to the same extent. Like, I was basically obsessed with computers when I was a teenager. Like, there's nothing else I really wanted to do. I was into sports. I played a little bit of music, but otherwise, yeah. all my time was spent on the computer, on the internet. Hmm. Like, they'd regularly have to, like, take my computer physically away from me as a punishment. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, like, I think, like, my, and my dad was a software engineer at a regular tech company. So I, oh, interesting. That's, that's probably part of it as well. So you think there's like a familial thing to it? I think so. I'm like they're they're super proud of the stuff I'm doing now. Like I don't I don't I don't blame them for putting a stigma on it. But I think the fact that they were so worried about it when I was in high school, and then I eventually decided like oh, I'm going to make my life out of this. Like I think there's always a bit of me that thinks like it's not quite legitimate. Yeah, well, I mean, even in the course of your and my lifetime, it's gone from when we were kids, you know, you th that whole, what you wound up going to school for, you really couldn't have done when you were, like, you know, born. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, things have shifted. Uh, they are shifting incrementally. I don't know whether it's a straight line. I think it's moving in a number of directions at the same time. Um. But um, so, people have also talked to me a lot about how, the games they make, sort of the way they literally look on showroom floors when you walk by or in screenshots on social media, um, those tend to heavily influence um, both the types of game that they make and also uh, what types of games get covered. So I don't want to dwell on uh, the game that you had published through Adult Swim, but, you know, Playing through it finally last year uh, when I started, I think I had started it. No, I emailed you. I downloaded it again last year. I'm kind of a jerk. Sorry. <laughs> Don't worry uh, about it. it took me it took me forever. Uh, and then I did finally email you and I started to play it. But y you know, I could tell this from the way it looked and what I saw. I mean, I guess that's just sort of one of the things I'm wondering about is because it does feel increasingly like and this is something else I talk to a lot of people about is is they feel like People, a lot of people aren't really making the games that they want to make. And obviously it's kind of a risky thing, so I just figure I would ask you, um, you know, why make a game with, uh, you know, no characters and only uh, walls and corridors? Because one would think that those wouldn't be exactly, you know, grabby in a showroom floor setting or just on screenshots. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think it comes back to, like, what you said is making the games that you want to make. And yeah. it comes back to like the the sacrifices you make by sort of taking the independent path and having a, a more rickety existence and not having the stability of a regular career. It's like if this is uh, you're paying the price, as you said. Yeah. In email thread. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, so if you're going to do that, you may as well do something weird, do what you want to make, because if you're going to if you're going to go off on your own and not have the stability or the support and then still try and make a game like everyone else is making, then what's the advantage, yeah. right? I mean, do you feel that way? I'm not asking you to point fingers or name names, but do you, I mean, maybe it's no different than in music or in movies or anything else. I mean, do you feel like, you know, a lot of games that people are making, is it, I mean, one person told me it's almost like people are trying to, like, solve genres of games. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, just, you just have it so we're completely set. I mean, do you do you get that feeling, too? Uh, yeah, a little bit, I would say. But, like, it's, it's hard to judge because it's such a personal thing, especially the smaller the team is. If it's one or two people, then you know they're right. sort of... Even if even if the game isn't super interesting to you, you know that there's a very good chance that they're indulging, like, their true passion. It's exactly what they want to make. Absolutely. And so, you know, it's it's not on me to say, why are you making that game? It looks so boring. You should make a crazy weird game like I did, you know? Yeah. Because, you know, maybe maybe they just want to reach a wider audience, which is something that I wasn't, like, striving for. When I was making the game, I was like, how can I get this in front of as many eyeballs as possible? It was more like, I want to make this game. I hope people like it. I mean, are there things you knew at the time when you decided to, you know, commit yourself to making and seeing it through? Like, are there things when you made that decision you knew you might be cutting yourself off from? Uh, you mean like in terms of audience? Yeah, well, or just audience or career or uh, you know momentum from releasing it. Um, I think I think it was all positive uh, in general. I was I was super. It's when I when I released the first demo of the game before I decided to sort of uh, jump on it full time as a project. It, right. it got way more attention than anything else I'd ever done. So it was kind of a no brainer to just dive into it and see what I could do with this project and just push it as much as possible. And mm -hmm. uh, like it was a super weird game, and that's that's what 
sort of helped me make the decision to go with a publisher because one of my friends, he said, you're making a really, really, really weird game and it will have an audience, but I think you need someone else to help you get it in front of those people. And that's why I think if I hadn't gone with a publisher, the game might not have even come out. So uh, I don't even know how you answer a question like this, um, but I mean, what what is the audience for a game like that? Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, I like I said, I'm just making it for myself, so I'm hoping that there's other people like me who would enjoy it. Um, yeah, because it's, it's not like I did like audience research. Uh, no, it's a laugh of recognition because it's exactly what I've done with uh, this project. Yeah. Um, and now I have a better sense of it, but that's like you know two, three years after the fact. It would have been different if I had put out the demo and like screenshots and trailers and no one had really given a shit. In that case, yeah. I might have been like, okay, maybe this vision is a bit too uh, relegated to my experience and no one else is really getting it. But, you know, I put it mm-hmm. out there and people seem to really enjoy it. They like the vibe. And so I was like, okay, maybe there's enough people out there that this can really resonate. So, I mean, when you, I mean, that's part of why I wanted to talk to you is because you did do a game like that and then you did sort of, you know, you went through the channels to get a broader release. And so, I mean, I'm just curious when you have talked to publishers and platform holders, I mean, like, what is their understanding um and expectation of a game like that? I mean, all my interactions with uh, sort of other businesses I've been partnering with to get the games out there, it's been super positive, and they've given a lot of uh, agency over to me because I think they realize that, you know, it's just me. I'm super independent. I'm super agile. I can move all over the place. I can change things at the drop of a hat. So uh, most of the conversations have been me being like, okay, Trust me, I can make this game. And then they'll say, okay, and then I go off and make the game. So there hasn't, there's not a huge amount of oversight, and I think that comes from like the past decade or so of platform holders and other companies uh, realizing that you can, you can take on a bunch of indies and just uh, give them free reign to work on what they want, and like diamonds will eventually rise to the top. <laughs> you know, because, I mean, it, yeah. there is... If you take in every indie game that wants to get in your platform, they're not all going to be gems, right? But right. Um, but if you just let creators, uh, you know, follow their own creative desires, whatever they want to do, I think yeah. I think they realize now you'll come up with some really really interesting stuff. So I mean, what makes what makes a, a Sony, you know, want to release that game? Like I said, I think they just I think they realize there's value in having interesting creative projects on their platform uh, like i can't right, like it's, no, such, a, it's I, such a huge company i can't speak to what sort of business sense it makes for them well i just mean from the interactions you had with them oh yeah i don't know um I, like i just do you know nick sutner yeah well yeah i mean he's not there anymore yeah right? sure yeah so that's basically i i talked to nick sutner at an event down in toronto when i was started working on the game and i said hey i have this demo you should check it out and then he emailed me back and says hey that's a cool demo you should put it on playstation and that's literally all there was to it <laughs> like so but they're not they're not i mean it's not like a, a record contract or something where they're no i think a lot of people assume it is like when i said oh the game's coming out on playstation and everyone's like oh how much money did they give you it's like oh no there's there's no money involved like there's Sometimes there is if they if they support a game and they sort of like co-publish it, but yeah. other times it's just you ask and they say yeah sure you do all the work and we'll let you put it on our platform. Yeah no I mean when I when I I mean I actually studied uh, music business that's what I got my degree and when I say like a record contract uh, I had the more pessimistic uh, reading of it in terms of like you know that you need to recoup. Uh, so I guess we're sort of talking about different sides of the same thing. So it doesn't even work like that where you need to necessarily recoup a certain amount to them. It's more like a, you're sharing the profits with them. Right right. Interesting. Um, I mean, I mean, do you think that's true then when people say that about, um, cause you mentioned, uh, conferences and that's how you met Nick. Um, people act like conferences, maybe it's just grass is greener. They feel like the thing they're not do, they're not doing is the thing that's key to, uh, having success. But I mean, when you showed at, um, I don't know what other conferences you went to, but when you did show, I mean, did you feel like you got equal amount of attention as uh, games that <laughs> had characters? <in> them? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's really funny. Like I haven't 
uh, I didn't show the game at a lot of uh, conferences and exhibitions simply because um, I, I didn't have the funds or the time or the manpower. The entire development of the game was pretty much like me locked in my office, just like working nonstop to get the game done. Um, yeah. just, and just because I never worked on a project of that size, so I had a really hard time planning all that sort of stuff. But um, I did go with Adult Swim to PAX Prime uh, a couple of years ago to show off the game. And they had these posters made up that people could take away as sort of souvenirs. And they had all the characters from the different games they were showing off on this yeah. poster. Like, they had Rain World and Duck Game and all the different characters. And then in the corner, they had this just, like, cassette tape hanging out. And it looks so bizarre because there's all these characters and they look super video gamey and they're all in these action poses. And then there's just, like, a cassette tape standing in the corner. And that that's the first time I looked at it like, oh, yeah, my game really isn't like any of these other games. But, I mean... Mm-hmm. It's still got attention at the show, so. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I have some questions here. Um, I don't know. I mean, we'll see. I, I sort of flip flopped on, on, on whether these are questions that are even like sort of fair to ask you, but we'll we'll, we'll see. Um, uh, I mean, this is sort of just a tentpole question that I ask a lot of developers. I mean, what, what do you think that the media um, doesn't understand about making games to the extent that? you know, the way they write about them ripples into, you know, what the audience doesn't understand about making games. Right. Um, I don't know. I think overall media and audience and everybody, um, there's a constant underestimation of how complicated and difficult games are to make. Even mm-hmm. with like Unity and Unreal Engine and all the recent game development tools that make it genuinely much easier to make a game, but making one that's good and huge with a big team and that works and doesn't have bugs and doesn't have like animation issues like the Mass Effect thing that happened earlier this year. Like yeah. it's it's insanely complicated. Um, and like I think even when people acknowledge that, they still don't realize the amount of work that goes into making the simplest things. And I can't hold it against them because it's it's very like domain specific knowledge as a game developer. Like we we're deep in this, we know everything about it. And if you're just covering it or you're writing about it or you just play them, obviously you're not going to know all that. But it definitely, I, def- I think it definitely affects the coverage that games get sometimes. How so? Like basically with the the uh, the Mass Effect animation thing. Where, wow, or just in, yeah. I mean, but do you feel like this is a this is like an ongoing thing? It doesn't seem to necessarily be improving or or worsening, or is it? I think is it more of a static thing? I think it genuinely is improving because every time there's sort of a backlash, like, oh, why does this AAA game look so shitty? Like, usually there's a couple articles like, hey, this was tough to make. Here are the reasons why it happened. The schedule got messed up. A bunch of people left the project. Games are difficult. Um, but I think it, not in a direct way, but sort of. Um, the the idea that games are sort of not that difficult to make, I think, uh, tinges the conversation about game developers and their games. Yeah. You know, like, why why didn't why didn't they just do this? It would have been so much simpler if they had just done this with their game. Or it's like, why don't they just port it to this platform? And these are such complicated questions that uh, I think sometimes it comes off as, like, why why are these game developers so lazy? Why don't they just do this? And that, you know, that can be tough to see. I've never had that happen to me, but I see that happen to other people and other people's games. I'm like, oh, it's, it's so much more complicated than that, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I, that was a, the next thing I had here about. I mean, I mean, I guess people call it sort of like an entitled nature to the audience. I mean, I feel like I see, you know, no matter the size of the team and the scope of the project, there's almost like a, Maybe media does this too, but I, I know definitely some portions of the audience too. Where there's almost like this impulsive reaction to make a list of what's wrong and to tell the person in your position, uh, you know, whether it is a you know giant Mass Effect thing where they almost delight in, uh, you know, sure it looks silly and funny, but I think it's also sort of an unspoken like these guys are idiots sort of uh, commentary. Um, I mean, have you, you said you haven't really dealt with it yourself, but have you talked to other developers about sort of like, you know, the best ways to deal with that sort of pushback and feedback? I mean, is there a, is there a line? I mean, Mass Effect is a weird example too, because they also, you know, changed the uh, ending of their trilogy because users were upset. So, I mean, there's certainly a line or at least a context in which, you know, you have to decide whether you think it's appropriate to field complaints to respond to them. I mean, like, what sort of is, uh, 
I mean, I don't know what your community is like. I know you know uh, Jeremy up there, but are there others that you've talked to who sort of have given you advice on how to deal with stuff like that? Oh, the, the other developers that I've talked to up here, they haven't had a huge number of issues. Like even um, like the Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes guys, they're part of the community up here, and they've, their game is massive. They've got like millions of players. Um, but I think they've got a genuinely really good community that supports them, and like the community has ideas for things they want to see in the game, but it never seems like complaints. So I think they've been yeah. they've been really fortunate to have a really supportive community. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I've never had like a direct conversation with anyone who's had a backlash over their game, uh, so yeah. I can't really speak to that. Sure. Well, what about like audience understanding of uh, you know? Because um, I always think of these types of complaints as being like counterbalanced with like you know the almost like people don't necessarily think of the people who make their games. That's something I've learned, too. This is super depressing. Um, it's sort of the way people talk about video games. It sounds like, you know, they're like a renewable resource where, like, they just, like... <laughs> yeah. They just, like, come spouting out of their backyard or something, or they can turn on the faucet. Well, I mean, with the number of indie games these days, it basically is. <sighs> yeah, but, I mean, and I, I think the thing that I think about um, when people complain about these things, that they don't really think about the people who make games as like being human beings, or that there are people attached to them. Um, I mean, are there things about the uh, reality of the lifestyle that you think that the media doesn't understand or doesn't consider, that the audience doesn't understand and doesn't consider? Yeah, I think I think there's just a when people see, say, like a game being published by 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 Devolver or on Xbox or on PlayStation, um, I think they assume immediately that that developer or that game has a lot more push or success behind it. Mm-hmm. Um, because, like, back a decade ago, if you had if you had a publisher or if you had a, a game on Xbox or PlayStation, you probably were a pretty big deal. You probably had like a, a golden game on your hands, or you had a big company. But these days like a single person like me can just get on those platforms and immediately some people seem to think like, Oh, you're a big shot. So you have the, you're like a company, you have salary, you have, uh, you know, you're well-funded, you, you have like this whole big team behind you, your game should be perfect. Whereas like, it's, it's no real different than someone just publishing their first game on steam. I mean, did you see, do you know who Adam Saltzman is? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, did you see the, uh, well, I, he, he shared a copy of it with me, but he made like a sort of uh, life as a full-time self, self-employed uh, game developer, sort of like a, I think it was sort of colloquially called like the Indie Survivability mm-hmm. Survey. Have you seen this? Uh, I don't think so, no. I can share it with you if sure. you want. It may not be that interesting because you know what that's like already. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I look at... Um, so I got about 634 responses here, um, and the number goes down in the survey on the question, how many games have you shipped? So basically, there's like a natural weeding out that occurs where it just, you know, it's 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 a hard, uh, you know, life. It's hard to sustain it. Um, I mean, I think, I think what you said is like, you know, you've been, I think the quote I have from your email here is you've been working pretty much seven days a week for the last six years uh, just so that you can make the things that you want to and you've barely scraped by. Yeah. I mean, are, are you, do you think that, I don't know how people feel about like, you know, the audience knowing things like these. Do you think like if the audience, you know, knew, you know, <laughs> about about stuff like that, like do you think that they would be nicer to developers? Do you think if the media knew they would be nicer? I mean, I, mean, I don't know, maybe, I mean, yeah, I don't know, maybe I'm just cynical, but I feel like if, if an audience was told that they just say stop complaining. Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, yeah, like I try not to I try not to talk about that stuff too much online. Like being a game developer is hard, but I don't want to complain about it cuz it's like my dream job. You know, I still get yeah. to I still get to, you know, live with my family in an apartment and make the games that I want all day. So as yeah. long as I can do that, I am I'm happy all day. So I don't really like to complain about it, but I don't think it would really make a difference even if I did and the audience was aware of it. Yeah, no, and I'm not really putting you in a position to to complain. I mean, it's uh, I just think it's increasingly, you know, I think it's because of the internet in a way. It's just it's gotten a lot harder for anyone trying to do creative stuff. Oh yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, I mean, in in this survey too, which you haven't seen, I'll ask just a couple questions. It, it does about, sound I mean, familiar. Uh, I might have seen it at one point. 
Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll show you a link with it. I'll show you the link with you after we're done. But I mean, basically, just said that like the majority of those who were able to be full time developers were, you know, just one person. Um, at the time of the survey, they'd only shipped one game. They had not been able to attend a con in the last year. They live alone. Most of them say that they're doing okay. Not really all that great. Not really all that awful. Um, I mean, what, what do you think people who are really deep into the culture, not even necessarily things to complain about, like, but what do you think that they don't grasp, like, the full picture of what it means to, you know, to live like this, if this is a thing that's important to you to really dedicate yourself to? Uh, I don't know. It's tough. Uh, I know it's such a personal thing, because I know some people who, who yeah. they almost, like, thrive on it. Like, they don't really have an issue with uh making sacrifices for their art and i don't either but i don't I, know it's hard to say mm -hmm. yeah i don't really have a, a, a solid answer for that to be honest that's okay i mean i didn't uh, this is sort of why i sort of flip flopped on asking these questions i mean do questions <laughs> like these even feel fair i mean do you no feel absolutely i really like talking, i mean i really like talking about this stuff it's just some of the things it's 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 tough to to be confronted with an idea you've never really thought about before. Yeah, I mean, one person just wrote like, you know, I I would not recommend this life to anyone unless they literally cannot imagine living uh, without having tried it. Even if our game does very well, I still uh, would not tell someone that this is a good idea. I mean, I guess just like, I mean, do, do you feel there is a typical um, when it comes to you know dedicating yourself to this this sort of lifestyle? I mean, is there a typical? Is that sort of a concept that just doesn't exist anymore. What like you mean a typical life of someone who decides to make games? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I get, uh, it's hard to say. Uh, I think I think more and more, if you're gonna make games on your own, you're gonna have to be comfortable with being very poor. Because like like you said, it's it's tough to to make a go of it on the internet these days. Um, yeah. And like I mentioned earlier, it, as soon as you have a, a plan for how you want to grow your business or make money or survive within six months, you're not going to be able to do that anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Like the uh, like the web games that I made when I first started making games, like that's that's not even a market anymore. No one can make money doing that, mm -hmm. and that's that was, that's only like five or six years ago. So, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, this is maybe somewhat related, but. Um, something that I think about a lot with this is sort of the, the, the disconnect between the, you know, well, like you said, uh, you know, there are people so deep in the game culture, they don't understand why everyone else, um, isn't freaking out about it. Um, can you just elaborate on the things that you see sort of people, I think you mean this in a positive way, people freaking out about things yeah. that they have no idea is like super out in the weeds that like the mainstream is not even like <laughs> even peripherally aware of yeah for sure well first of all it, like among game developers i find it a lot because um like helping to start up this game community in ottawa over the past uh couple years most if not all of my friends are game developers whether mm -hmm. professionally or just uh for fun so it can be uh, sort of jarring sometimes to be put in a social situation, people who aren't game developers. And then suddenly you're like, mm -hmm. is there anything I can even speak about with these people that will make sense? Cause I'm just so used to talking to game developers. So like even mm -hmm. describing what I do to some people um, afterwards, I'm like, did, did anything I say make sense to them just because I'm so used to talking game development lingo with other game developers all the time. And so that's mm -hmm. I, I, like, it's, yeah, it's it's just very insular in that way. And then also, yeah. just I spend a lot of time on Twitter just because I'm a game developer and you kind of have to. <laughs> um, and that that's another huge example of just a very insular game development community. And and gamers yeah. gamers as well, you know. Um, and I just don't think they realize that even as the number of, of quote unquote gamers rises you know with uh, mobile games and casual games and you know everyone's a gamer these days it's it's not the same right. as them being a gamer you know it's like yeah and it's like someone who grew up you know playing zelda and having every single console is not the same as someone who just plays uh like candy crush on their phone every now and then despite them both being gamers and people seem to equate them which is a bit weird so, yeah, I mean, 
this must, this might be annoying to define, but um, uh, these are the types of things that I'm trying to sort of collect and highlight is because I think there are those types of disconnects. So like, what is the difference in terms of uh, understanding or awareness or even just, <laughs> you know, ongoing interest in video games between a person who, you know, grew up um, buying every console, you know, maybe importing games, playing every major tentpole series, and, um, you know, someone who didn't. Um, but, yeah, like, what's sort, of, what's sort of the difference in the awareness that you're talking about? Um, I think because uh, the former is sort of more an enthusiast, you know, as well as being a gamer. They like playing games, but they're also super interested in games. They want to know what's in development, who the creators are, when things are coming out, yeah. if things are delayed, if there's a sequel, if it's going to be a prequel, if their characters are going to be coming back, what kind of DLC there's going to be. And then more casual gamers, they just like see a game they want to play and then they play it for a while. And then that's their entire experience with gaming, you know? Mm-hmm. And while they are both game players, there's a huge sort of gulf between those two uh, levels of engagement in the games themselves. 